All right, who's back for the chaos? I'm back for the chaos! I said, who's back for the chaos? I'm back for the chaos! In case you missed the first part of this three-part video series about my abusive ex-boyfriend, here's what you need to know. When I was 13, I was coerced into an abusive relationship by a grown man threatened to harm himself or me if I didn't send him at least 30 snapshots of my underage body every day, no matter what. Whew. That was a mouthful. Anyway, I left off in the last video explaining that this was only the beginning because Harris pressured, manipulated, and threatened me into leaving all of my family in North Carolina and going to a college that he chose for me 30 minutes from his house in California. Hashtag relationship goals, am I right? Nope. Nope, I'm not. Now, before we get into the thick of it, I really want to stress this. Don't blame my parents for what happened to me. Stranger danger? Got it. Don't know squares? Don't touch them. They taught me to stand up to people like Harris. They even tried breaking us up at one point because they were suspicious that this very thing was happening. And that's a whole nother story I'll have to get into later. Just please understand, they did everything they could to protect me. But mom and dad can't always stop bad people from doing bad things. So if you're looking for someone to blame here, maybe blame the guy who abused me? I don't know, it was, it was a long shot, I just thought I'd throw it out there. If you remember from last time, Harris told me to never tell my parents about our friendship. But as our relationship grew worse and worse, my gut was like, girl, this is whack. And y'all, when something doesn't feel right, listen to your gut. So in an attempt to leave, I came clean to my parents about talking to Harris, but I was too afraid to talk about the abuse. I felt like I deserved it for not listening to them earlier, you know? So when I came clean, I was expecting, no, I was hoping, praying they'd take my phone away, throw my computer in a dumpster, and burn the Wi-Fi. Since Harris wasn't letting me go, I saw my parents as the only way out. Again, they tried breaking us up in the past, years prior. I didn't care what kind of trouble I would be in now, as long as they got him out of my life. And my parents said, look, you're 17. You'll be 18 in September. You're going off to college soon. You're becoming an adult. If you trust this guy now, so can we. And hearing that, Knowing the gross things he was doing to me, and knowing if I spoke out about it that he'd kill himself or me, I felt like I was telling my parents the biggest lie to their face. But I didn't know what else to do, because Harris was saying stuff like this. A little later, I was accepted to a college Harris chose for me. Tuition started at $30,000 a year, but he said, money doesn't matter, love does. How nice! I'm being sarcastic. So in February, my mom and I flew out to California to visit the school and meet Harris and his family for the first time. On the car ride to his house, I was holding the flowers we got for his family. I remember feeling so torn about it all. Is this what love is? He told me that this is love. This is what boyfriends and girlfriends do for each other. This was my first real boyfriend, too, and he was so much older than me, so I guess he knew best. He also treated me horribly, called me fat, and demanded pictures even though I cried every time. Why am I at his house? Why am I here with my mom? Why are we meeting him and his parents? Why am I not saying anything? Why am I not screaming? Why am I not- Alyssa? And the first thought that came to mind when I saw Harris in person for the first time was this. Oh, I can kick your butt. Seriously. The first thought that came to mind when I finally met this guy who's abusive and supposed to be my boyfriend was, oh, I am confident I could kick your butt right here, right now. This kid was thinner than a string bean. Mother trucker had a BMI of two, maybe. And look, I talk a lot of shit for someone who can barely hold a gallon of milk. But when you come into my life and make me feel body conscious, you better be buffing the Mr. Clean with that attitude. Up until now, I was afraid of Harris. But after seeing the weak little chicken leg he really was in person, I felt powerful. I felt confident. I felt reassured that I could handle his abuse. That if he did try to hit me, abuse me, or even kill me, I could defend myself. I felt at ease in our relationship. Seriously. That's how messed up your reasoning gets in these kinds of relationships. And this is called rationalizing. Rationalizing is an attempt to explain or justify one's own or another's behavior or attitude with logical, plausible reasons, even if these reasons aren't true or appropriate. On top of that, I remember thinking too, if I called the police, I don't have any bruises. They won't be able to get him out of my life for good if there's no physical evidence of his abuse. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words can't hurt you, right? I need to wait till he snaps. Then I'm a victim of abuse. Otherwise, I'm just crazy and overreacting like Harris says I am. Then we went on our first date. 
We went to a pretty outdoor mall, and the plan was to get dinner, see a movie, and for me to be back at the hotel by 12. But that didn't happen. When we entered the theater, Harris noticed that we were the only ones there. He then pressured me into doing things with him. I firmly said no, but while we were watching the movie, he grabbed me and touched me, and I freaked out. I told him not to do that, and again, I said, I don't want to do anything in the movie theater. After a little while of just sitting and watching the movie, he said, you know what, this is boring, let's go, and he walked out. And since I was from the middle of nowhere and didn't know Uber was a thing, also I've literally never been to California and have no idea where I am, he was my only way home. So I followed him out. By this time, the rest of the mall was closed and everything was dark. There was no one around, just me and him. And as we walked through this deserted mall, he leaned over and said, I've had a all night for you. I told him I needed to be back at 12, so we should probably get going. What? We finally meet in person, we go on our first date, and we don't even make out? That's not fair. Okay, we can make out in the car then, but... After that, I need you to take me back. And by the way, you don't owe anyone anything, boy or girl, young or old, especially when they treat you like this. Consent is everything. Consent is permission for something to happen or the agreement to do something. And if you have to convince, manipulate, or beg someone to do something, that's not consent. There's a really good video that uses tea to explain consent. I'll leave a link to that in the description. So we get in his car and we make out for a little bit. And on top of being a predator, an abuser, and an all-around piece of garbage, he was also a horrible kisser. That's the tea, sis. I kept an eye on the time and watched as it ticked past my curfew. We should really go now. Nah, your mom's probably asleep. It'll be fine. Which was true. She wasn't calling me or texting me or asking where I was. I wish she was doing that. Okay, well, I'm afraid someone will see us making out and we'll get in trouble, so... I should really go back to the hotel. I have an idea. How about we go into a parking garage and do some stuff there? No, I'd really rather just go back to the hotel. I'll bring you back after. You worry too much. No, I I don't want my mom to get mad at me. I really would just rather- So? He drove us to a parking garage. I don't like that section of the mall anymore. By the time he dropped me off, my mom was awake. She told me how worried she was, how I should have at least texted her, should have called her, should have said something, done something, let her know what was going on. And I agreed. As I took my shoes off, I just felt so weird. I wanted to scream, to cry, to tell my mom what just happened to me with that man right there in the doorway. But I was so shocked. I couldn't say anything. I was so mad at myself. What happened to thinking I was stronger than him? That I could and would defend myself. Why didn't I fight back? Why did I freeze up? Why did I just sit there and cry and let it happen to me? No one's gonna believe me now. I didn't put up a fight. I don't have any bruises. And even though I said no a million times, maybe I should have said it louder. Maybe it's my fault. After that, I flew back to North Carolina and my mental health only worsened. I became apathetic, depressed, irritable, anxious. I kept having nightmares about that night, I'd wake up crying or screaming. Since February 5th, I had completely shut down, as if Harris had successfully reprogrammed me to be his little robot. When he texted me, I texted back immediately. When he wanted me to be awake, I stayed awake. And when he demanded pictures, I sent them. Six months later, mid-August, I flew back to California, this time to stay. My whole family went with me for orientation week and move in. During this time, Harris demanded to be there every second of the day. But of course, he couldn't and I couldn't change that. Finally, one day, I found the courage to put my foot down and say, I need a break. I need you to leave me alone. We can hang out after orientation ends on Thursday. And as you can imagine, Harris didn't like me having this much control. He blew up my phone with his usual threats before giving me the silent treatment. Monday night, my school hosted a barbecue at the beach, and I actually had a great time. I met a ton of people who would later become some of my best friends. But when I got back to my dorm, Harris called me. Where are you? I'm at my dorm. Why aren't you answering me? We're on a break till Thursday. Just, just read what I said. And he hung up. That's when I realized I had eight missed calls and 24 unread texts. I was standing in my dorm room, boxes everywhere, looking at my school schedule. Where class wasn't written, Harris was. And that's when I realized I just couldn't do this anymore. But I knew every time I tried to leave in the past, he threatened the worst of the worst. And I stayed with him to avoid that. So me leaving meant it might really happen. But... 
I decided I'd rather die putting up a fight than let him have his way with me any longer. At least then, there'd be evidence. And it happened. I called him, and I told him I was breaking up with him. He screamed at me, threatened to kill himself. He threatened to kill me. I hung up, and he texted me, Die, 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 die. I hope you die. You deserve to die. Then he went silent. I was used to this when I lived thousands of miles away from him, but now that he was 30 minutes north, he knew what college I was at, he knew where I was. I locked the door and called the police. I told the operator what was going on, and she told me to come down to the station to file a report and a restraining order, but that didn't happen. When I showed the officer my ID, he refused to believe a 17-year-old from North Carolina was attending a college up the street and therefore refused to believe anything else I had to say. He refused me a restraining order. He refused to even investigate. He threw my license back at me and said, next time, leave the adult things to the adults. Okay, sweetheart? And if you go running back to your little boyfriend, don't call us. And look, I understand that might be hard to believe, but the fact is, this is what happens in these kinds of cases. Some cops are nice. Some cops are helpful. And then some just don't see how fatal these situations can be. In 2016, about a year and a half after the parking garage incident, I learned the statute of limitations for what happened to me would be up soon. Statute of limitations refers to a statute prescribing a period of limitation for the bringing of certain kinds of legal action. So basically, if a crime is committed, depending on where you live, you have a certain amount of time to report it. And this is where people like me get a lot of backlash. There are a million reasons why it's so hard to seek justice, let alone even leave an abusive relationship. I mean, just look at what Harris would do. Some abusers actually go through with those threats. Some stalk you long after it happens, and I'm one of the lucky ones who's still alive to tell this story. And on top of that, some police just don't listen to people like me. They refuse restraining orders. They refuse to even investigate. They refuse to listen. Why? You're overreacting. It's not that serious. Quit blowing things up out of proportion. And honestly, hearing those words from your abuser, and then from the people who are supposed to help you, it breaks you. It reaffirms what should never be said. I was afraid to go back to the station after what that cop told me, but I also knew I deserved and needed help. And thankfully, a really nice officer who I would love to name, but I respect his privacy, helped me out. But we couldn't get a strong enough case. There was no way to press charges against him because we can't prove he sent those messages. He could easily say, yeah, that's my computer and my account, but my sister wrote that. You can't prove I typed that out and hit send, and he'd be right. The only way to fight this is through getting his confession, which we tried, but of course he refused and blocked my number. That's why charges were never filed. That's why I didn't get justice. And that's why he is still out there. That's why I avoid going certain places where I know he might be. That's why I keep tabs on his social media, because he started going places near my school and apartment. That's why it's hard for me to fall in love again. It's hard for me to trust people. It's hard for me to understand what relationships even are or what their purpose is. But thankfully, I'm with much better people now. A month after leaving Harris, I dated a guy named Calvin. He was super sweet, he never treated me anything like Harris did, he respected my boundaries, and he liked me just for me, baggage and all. We later broke up because we were better off as friends, and we still are. Hi, Galvin. A few months later, I caught up with a friend you guys might know, Chris Tanimato. At the time, he had just started working for It's Alex Clark. After some awkward nights, Chris and I ended up dating. And that's a really good story I can't wait to tell. I interned for a little bit for It's Alex Clark, and I learned how to do story time animation on YouTube. I started posting videos in January 2018, and I gained a bit of traction. And from there, I made a bunch of really good online friends. And I met them at my first VidCon in 2018. Someone also stole my phone at VidCon, which had a really pathetic voicemail that Harris left me when I broke up with him. But since I can't retrieve it, here is a dramatic reenactment. <clears throat> Lissa, why won't you pick up? You need to, you need to call me back. I'm, call me back. And here is his final Facebook message to me. Ah, memories. After that, I landed a summer job working for Tim Tom. I kept posting videos and I posted part one of this video. And it blew up. And I know a lot of people would say to that, well, I guess things happen for a reason, but I don't think so. I don't want to thank Harris for putting me through this awful thing just because it led me to where I am now. He doesn't deserve credit for that. In fact, he doesn't deserve anything short of being dipped into a volcano limb by limb and dying a slow and horrible death. 
but that's just my opinion. What matters here is, I finally chose my own path. But after staying in California all these years, knowing Harris is just up the road from me, he's watching everything I do, he's going to places he knows I'll be, I better give him something to look at. I know, there's something here that he's not telling me. I was worried because I was like, what if he does something to my family? Age 13 to 18, like that was my every day. You don't know the depths of it. I love 